if we look at the last, uh, the last century in cancer care, near enough, uh, 1918 to 2018, where have we come from um, and, and how far have we advanced, what's the extent of progress, but also how, what's the speed of that progress, how quickly are we evolving um, cancer treatment. I said it started in 1918, I told you a lie, it starts at the end of 1917, but hey-ho. So interestingly, this is the molecular structure um, of 1,1-thiobis-2-chloroethane, um, also known as Iperite, because one of the first applications of mustard gas was at Ypres in, or Yp, in World War I in Belgium. In World War I alone, um, around 1.2 million soldiers, civilians, were exposed to this gas, um, and more than 91,000 died because of its effects. Obviously, that's a tragedy, but you could argue out of that tragedy came cancer treatment as we know it. Um, a lot of soldiers, especially in the US military, um, were observed and the effects of this gas on them were observed and they found uh, decreased uh, levels of neutrophils, decrease or, or depletion of, of uh, lymphoid tissue. And so they started to see that this incredibly toxic gas had, was having an effect on cells and was able to kill cells. There's a really uh, interesting period of history here where uh, the American government, the Warfare Department, obviously realised this was a powerful weapon and needed an antidote. Um, so what they did was they discovered something called nitrogen mustard. So you take the, uh, you take the sulphur atom out of the molecule, replace it with a nitrogen, um, you still have a toxic compound, but you have one that's able to help with some of the, the worst effects of this drug. Um, we'll come on to that shortly. Um, moving forward 10 or so years, we have this guy, Dr. George Papanicolaou. Um, who discovered that if you look at cells from the vagina under a microscope, you can actually detect cellular, cellular differences between healthy cells and cancerous cells. Um, hence, pap smear, pap test, papanicolaou, that's where that comes from. Um, but the reason this is important is because he was one of the pioneers of early detection in cancer. Again, we heard last week that even today, this is still a massive unmet need um, across oncology, is early detection. Um, and this guy was one of the first people to notice that and really do something about it. Moving forward to, to the early 40s, we come back to nitrogen mustard because I mentioned earlier that this was an example from warfare, from the US Warfare Department. Because of that, a lot of the research around this was incredibly uh, top secret, and today it remains redacted, so we can only learn a, uh, a limited amount. But what we do know is that um, in 1941, a man only known as JD, um, a 48-year-old male, uh, presented to this doctor, Gustav Linskog, who was a thoracic surgeon. He had a type of uh, leukemia. He'd already been through um, the available radiation therapies. He'd been through surgery. Um, his prognosis, and I quote, was deemed hopeless. Um, so he came to Gustav Linskog, who had heard of nitrogen mustard. It was still very much experimental at the time, but he thought, you've been through everything. Let's, let's try something new. So he gave him nitrogen mustard. Um, he received the first dose at 10 a.m., 27th of August, um, and that in history is the first known application of an anti-cancer drug to a human being. Um, the results were incredible. Uh, he went into total remission in terms of uh, malignancies uh, in his body. Um, and they thought this was a miracle cure. They thought this was a miracle drug. Um, sadly, uh, quite quickly, he relapsed. And on the 1st of December, he died in um, 1942. But despite that, nitrogen mustard was still approved later by the FDA in 1942 as the first anti-cancer treatment. So we have a lot to thank this man and JD, whoever he is, um, for modern cancer treatment. Moving forward to 1953, um, we have these two, Roy Hertz, an endocrinologist, and, and Min Chu Lee, an oncologist, who were able to uh, provide the first cure of a human solid tumour. Um, they were treating a patient with a choriocarcinoma, which is a solid tumour of reproductive tissue, mainly affects women. Um, and actually, what they, gave, uh, what they gave the patient was MTX methotrexate, used ubiquitously across healthcare now, um, nowadays obviously known for its toxicity, um, but was able to provide good, pa uh, good results to that patient with choriocarcinoma um, and were seen as an advance in the field at the time because of the results that they achieved. Then in 1956, we have the first bone marrow transplant. So this was done in New York. This is two very young twins, one of whom was perfectly healthy, one of whom had leukemia again. Um, and so what they did was take some of the bone marrow uh, out of the healthy twin implant into the twin with leukemia, um, and he achieved complete remission. Um, nowadays, we have um, this kind of treatment going on across hematological cancers. So um, uh, bone marrow transplants, autologous stem cell transplants are uh, some of the first line standards of care in things like multiple myeloma, sickle cell anemia, and that kind of thing. Um, so again, those two twins, those two young twins in New York, 
uh, you could argue were pioneers of, of some of the standards of care across blood cancers today. Um, 1975, uh, TNF, tumor necrosis factor, was discovered. This is its um, ribbon protein structure. Um, the reason why this is important is because uh, when they discovered tumor necrosis factor, the reason that was exciting was because it was the first naturally occurring substance, if you like, that was observed to be able to, um, uh, to kill cancer cells, basically. So it's an element of the immune system that was able to kill cancer cells. And this is what really sowed the seed for um, manipulating the immune system to treat cancer. So you could argue that um, the discovery of TNF in 1975 um, sowed the seed for immuno-oncology and immunotherapy, which we'll talk about um, later. Uh, 1977, the first targeted therapy, so we've got um, tamoxifen targeting the estrogen receptor, uh, originally for metastatic uh, breast cancer. 1997, the first humanized antibody, so here we've got uh, rituxan, rituximab, now used across, again, all sorts of blood cancers and hematological malignancies. Um, even out, outside of cancer, it's used for rheumatoid arthritis. Um, but it's the first therapeutic application of, um, of a monoclonal antibody um, in cancer. Then 2004, so here we start to get to some of the really, uh, the really pioneering innovative treatments. We have Avastin, which was first licensed in 2004 for colorectal cancer, um, but is also now used across all sorts of different treatments, um, marketed by Roche, I think. Um, all sorts of solid tumours, um, massively, massively valuable, high-selling drug in oncology. Um, 2010, this one's really interesting. Uh, this is the first therapeutic vaccine for cancer. Obviously, you have prophylactic vaccines for things like um, cervical cancer, but this was the first vaccine that was given as a treatment for metastatic prostate cancer. Um, this was only developed in 2010. Uh, only eight years later, this has now been completely superseded by um, small, much cheaper, much more effective small molecules. So that gives you an idea of the pace, the pace of innovation in cancer. Um, 2011. I don't know if anyone in the room saw this, and this was all over like, public news, um, all over the internet when this happened. Um, this was a patient with advanced um, tracheal cancer and for whom no treatment was working. So what scientists did was uh, basically build a framework out of porous polymers, pretty much in a test tube in a laboratory, um, and then effectively built an artificial trachea from the patient's own stem cells around that scaffolding of polymer. Um, specifically from the patient's own stem cells so that it wouldn't be rejected when it was implanted. And they then surgically implanted this new model trachea into the patient um, and he, I believe he made a full recovery um, with, with minimally affected respiratory function and, and that kind of thing. So um, super impressive stuff. 2011 again, first checkpoint inhibitor. Um, I'm sure you've all heard of IO. We're going to come on to checkpoint inhibition later, but ipilimumab was one of the first of this category, a category that we know is still growing in cancer. 2014, uh, the Cancer Genome Atlas. Again, another really important advance in cancer because uh, these guys were undertaking a study in gastric cancer, and they realized that gastric cancer is not actually one disease, as we now know for many cancers, but they saw it as four. And the reason they saw that variety and those different types of gastric cancer was because they noticed that if you look at different parts of the same cancer, you see different genetic profiles. So this work by TCGA um, really sowed the seed for um, a fundamental shift in the way we look at cancer, a shift that is relevant today right here. Um, another thing we're going to come on to later, but these guys sowed the seed for the idea of a genomic model of taxonomy for cancer rather than... Um, an anatomical model. 2017, we have the first CAR T-cell therapy. This is a type of immunotherapy. Uh, it's chimeric antigen receptor T-cell, so um, it's basically a model where you take the patient's own T-cells out of their body, engineer them to respond to certain treatments, plant, and then implant them back in. Um, ASCO this year um, announced CAR T-cell therapy as their uh, biggest advance of the year, if you like. Uh, for the last two years, that was checkpoint inhibitors. So the fact that they've announced CAR-T uh, for that award this year is, is pretty significant. And then finally, for the history lesson, um, we have Foundation Medicine. So this is um, a really, really interesting company, one, uh, one we had the pleasure of briefly working with in, in London. It's a subsidiary of Roche who work entirely um, in their diagnostic division. Um, and they basically produce diagnostic tests to help with things like genomic sequencing in cancer. Um, in 2017, at the end of 2017, this particular test, Foundation Medicine, uh, Foundation CDX, 
um, was approved by the FDA. What this test does um, is enable doctors to uh, sequence the genome of, of, a, of a solid tumour. And then it goes beyond that, not only to, re to recommend the best treatment for that tumour with that genetic profile, but even to scan um, available open clinical trials at any given time and recommend if that patient is eligible for those trials. Um, and this is something we're seeing more and more with things like immunotherapy, is not only how do, we, uh, how do we give effective treatments, how can we predict response, but how can we give doctors the best <laughs> tools, um, how can we equip them with what they need to be able to make uh, informed decisions to give every patient the best chance of responding. So that's very much where we've come in the last 100 years. Um, we've got the mainstay of cancer treatment, which is chemotherapy, radiotherapy, surgery. We've started to see new and innovative treatments coming, like immunotherapy, which I'll talk about a little bit. Um, but we're really at a point now where we've recognised that there are big limitations to these approaches. Um, we've seen massive advancement. So as I spoke about last week, um, in leukaemia in kids, for example, we've, we can um, now cure the majority of, of children. Um, but there are still big limitations, and there are certain cancers that we can manage better than other ones. And, and it's going to um, take the next few years to really understand why we can't treat those as well. Um, and some really innovative thinking about how we're going to approach those better. So what we now know is we've got immune cells around the cancer cells and we know that there's a specific type of immune cell called the T cell. Now, I'm not going to go into the specifics of what a T cell is, which is beyond the scope of this, but rest to say that there is a type of immune cell called the T cell and it's very, very important in the development of cancers, how they grow, how they survive. And we now understand, help um, with thanks to this, better understanding of cancer biology, that you have cancer cells and you also have T cells in very, very close alignment. And as I said last week, um, the immune system and cancer are very, very good friends, but they don't always get on well. So what you have essentially in cancer is you have a system where, so I said that the cancer cells can, for example, make blood vessels grow quicker to help them. It brings in more things that help it grow quickly and it gets rid of things that stop it growing. What it does to the T cells is it actually turns them off. So it sends out signals, it has um, molecules, proteins on its surface that interact with T cells, and the T cell would naturally say, you're a threat, you're foreign, you're not supposed to be there. What the cancer actually does is it's quite sneaky and manipulative. It actually turns the T cells off. So what you get is a system where you have these T cells surrounding cancer cells that would naturally kill them. But the cancer cells recognize that, and it's actually adapted, it's evolved to make sure that that doesn't happen. And what our current approach in terms of immuno-oncology centers around playing about the interaction between the T cell and between the cancer cell. So at the moment, checkpoint inhibitors play on a set of molecules. One sprouts from the T cell, one sprouts from the cancer cell. And the way those two things interact is for the cancer cell to switch off the T cell. And that's where checkpoint inhibitors come from. We call these proteins immune checkpoints which is where the term checkpoint inhibitor comes from. So what this protein does is essentially interact to turn the T cell off. What these drugs do is they get rid of that interaction. So the T cell's then able to do its job and kill the cancer cell. So that, in essence, um, it's probably new news to some of you, old news to some of you, that is how a T cell works to kill a cancer cell, and that's how that process is um, kind of facilitated by the addition of um, checkpoint inhibitors. A big theme at the moment in oncology and the way cancer care is moving is this idea that uh, it's no longer a field for doctors. Uh, we were all spoken to last week by an engineer. Um, this is a process that involves physicists. We've spoken about genomics, biologists. Um, cancer is, is uh, certainly becoming a field of um, immense variety and immense scope for different professions to come together. And I think this is a great example um, of that kind of approach. I want to talk a little bit about what an X-ray is. It's a photon, so it's photons. Um, so all the electromagnetic radiation, um, we can obviously see visible light, but either side of that there are different, there are, um, different wavelengths. <coughs> X-ray um, is uh, just a form of electromagnetic radiation, so light, but it's at a different wavelength. So it's particles. So another name for radiotherapy and what I'll come on to talk about is proton ion therapy is particle therapy. It's basically bombarding stuff with loads and loads of uh, like um, tennis balls. You imagine um, someone on one of those machines that fires tennis balls. 
It's kind of like that. It's just literally bombarding stuff with loads and loads and loads of particles. So there are different particles that we can use. What we've used up to now is uh, photons, so essentially light energy, but a different um, energy in a different wavelength. What that does um, in terms of, and I'm not an artist, but in terms of if you imagine someone's, someone's head and their brain kind of sits, sits like that. They've got a tumor in the middle of their brain. We spoke about this before. It's going to be very difficult to get to that surgically. You're going to cause a lot of damage going in there. Um, and it's probably going to be more than actually treating the tumor. But with conventional radiotherapy, what you do is you essentially shoot a beam of photons through. So what you do is you beam through like that. And you make it as wide as the tumor. So it irradiates everything in that track. So what it's going to do is it's going to irradiate the tumour. And what does that actually mean? What does it actually mean to irradiate something? Well, like I said, that these are just particles. So they're just photons going in. And if you think about it, if you've got a load of particles, if you've got a load of molecules that make up the tumour, and then if you've got a load of particles coming in, which are all photons, they're going to bounce off each other. And that's how it works. So that's how you get, you get all these photons coming in and they bounce off and they cause damage, you know, they, the, the actual mechanisms are beyond me, but the, the particles interact with particles, they bounce off each other and they cause damage, and that's toxic to the tumour cell, which is great, but the problem is that as well as being toxic to the tumour, it's also toxic to everything else in the track. So it's going to be toxic to all this stuff that's in the way, and it's going to be toxic to all this stuff that's behind it as well. And things like stereotactic radiosurgery, where we can build an advanced 3D model you know, we've got very, very good at directing the beams in three directions, so we can almost customise the beam so it's, it minimises the amount of damage as, as much as possible. But the problem still remains that you're still going to get damage to healthy tissue. So that, that means that we've been working on this. And what we've been working on is using different particles. So we've used photons up to now. But what we've um, come to learn is that there are other particles that can be used instead, and they have slightly different properties. So I'm going to show you our friends here again. That's the brain. So if we have our tumour back, we can also use protons, so, which are hydrogen ions. So instead of photons, we're just using a different type of particle using hydrogen ions. And we've got our hydrogen ions here, and we send them in. Just exactly the same way as we do with photons with conventional radiotherapy. But the interesting thing about doing this is, instead of just delivering ionization all the way across the beam, what it does is it actually delivers ionization preferentially at the end of the track. So what it does is it delivers most ionization at the tumor. And it delivers very little ionization here, and it delivers no ionization after the tumor. So what you've got there is you've got kind of a very, very targeted beam of ionization that's acutely concentrated where the tumour is, which is really exciting because what it does is it delivers most of your dose at the tumour a little bit before it and, and nothing behind it, which is, which is amazing um, because it means that the potential for toxicity is much, much, much less. And often in radiotherapy, people say that the toxicity is actually is so bad that it, mean, you know, it means they can't complete the treatment, it means that there's big complications. If we can do that, then that's something very significant. What you can also do is you can also use a different particle. So you can use carbon ions. Um, it's much, much less common than proton beam therapy, but it's still the same principle. They're particles that go in and bombard, cause damage. So that's essentially, in a nutshell, proton beam therapy. It exists. There are some, I think there are something like 80 centers in the world that are doing this. I think there's one at the Christie down the road. I may be wrong. Um, but it's something that's, it is available. It's in the early stages, but it's something that's exciting. Now, there is actually um, a crossover, and Ben touched on it in terms of the use of gold um, in tumours. There's a crossover with nanotechnology, and we'll come on to talk about this in a bit more detail. But if you introduce nanoparticles into a tumour, then you essentially increase the number of targets for particles to interact with. So if you go back to that image of kind of a tumour with lots and lots of different molecules in, lots and lots of different um, bricks, if you like, that these particles can hit and cause damage. You're essentially increasing the number of them. 
is the way that I like to think about it. So what you're doing by introducing nanoparticles or gold in the example of cyberknife is you're kind of maximizing the effect of the ionization at that point. So you're kind of potentiating the dose that you're giving, which means that you can effectively give lower doses and still maintain the same effect. So what you can then do is you can, you can reduce even further the, the dose to the healthy tissue. So you can get your toxicity level down even further. So there's a big crossover here with the use of nanotechnology. So there's a theme coming here that's, it, historically it was only healthcare, healthcare professionals that, used, that delivered radiotherapy, but we now use physicists routinely in, de in delivering stereotactic radiosurgery. Um, we're going to use things like nanoparticles. You know, we, we heard last week from an engineer. Clearly, we're going to have to have people who understand them. There's a lot of people that have to be involved in this beyond our traditional model of what a healthcare professional is. So it's not just us standing here and saying, you know, we're moving towards holistic care. Like, there is no way you'd be able to do this unless you had m multiple different people with different skill sets in the room. We've spoken about a couple of ways that nanotechnology can be used to increase the effectiveness of existing treatments. Um, and we've, we've covered a few of those, but there are some others as well. And just to give you some examples, um, so you can actually combine um, inside the nanoparticle chemotherapy with other drugs as well. So they're delivered at the same site at the same time. Um, and that can be really useful because we know that people can become resistant to chemotherapy. Like Ben was just saying, the tumour can come up with subvertive ways to get around the things that are being thrown at it. So it evolves and it gets around the mechanisms that we're using against it. What you can do with nanobubbles and nanoparticles, you can deliver chemo drugs and drugs that target that resistance at the same time. So you can almost give a double hit at the same time. That's interesting. Um, we heard about last week from um, Prof Stride that the centre of tumours is sometimes oxygen deprived. Um, so you can deliver nanoparticles with oxygen in that re-oxygenate the core and allow chemotherapy to work more effectively. There are other interesting things. So we know that the majority of chemotherapy only reaches the outside the surface of tumours. Um, what if you could put it in a nanoparticle that was uh, magnetically charged and so you could almost drag it through into the middle of the tumour. Again, interesting application. And again, we've spoken about increasing the potency of existing treatments, so conventional radiotherapy um, and more advanced techniques like uh, other particle therapies, so proton beam therapy, carbon ion therapy, that kind of thing. Um, and just to finish off, this is, we're pushing this you know, even further, nanorobots. Yeah, absolutely. So this is, um, you probably guessed just from the name, this is probably unlikely to reach the clinic in the next 10 years, um, but we had to include it because it's really exciting. But effectively what this is and what it's being called is an intelligent drug delivery system. So I think the, the name nanorobot is slightly misleading because it's, it is not a robot, it's not made of metal, it's not, um, you know, it's not machine learning or anything to do with that. Um, but it's effectively um, like a sandwich uh, of two sheets uh, of, of DNA. Um, the Nature paper refers to it as DNA origami. And between those two sheets of DNA is your drug. Um, and the drug they used was, was thrombin, so it causes blood clots. Um, and once you've got the drug sandwiched between your two sheets of DNA, it's effectively zipped all the way around so that the drug can't escape. What's really clever about this is it's, it's been engineered, so the only way it can unzip and release that drug in the middle is by interacting with a very specific target. And the target these guys chose was a protein called um, nucleolin, which is almost exclusively expressed within the blood vessels of tumours. So what they do is they inject, they inject this uh, DNA sandwich, if you like, uh, straight into the systemic circulation. Um, it will go through your blood vessels and when it gets to um, a tumour blood vessel where there's lots of this nucleolin lining the walls of the blood vessel, it will uh, stick to it, interact with it and recognise it. Um, and once it's recognised that it's in a tumour and it's in a place where it's appropriate to release that drug, the zipping around the edge unzips and that drug is released in an incredibly targeted manner. What this enables is effectively um, you can release a drug like thrombin straight into the, uh, the key vasculature of a tumour, the key blood vessels of a tumour, um, and basically use the natural clotting, clotting cascade to block those blood vessels, blood vessels in a very natural way, but in an incredibly targeted way. And that's why they're calling it a very intelligent um, drug delivery system. Um, obviously, once they've blocked the blood vessels, the tumour can't grow, it can't get oxygen and, and you get that tumour death again. But what's really interesting and another massive question mark is that this is totally immuno immunologically inert. 
So this is sheets of DNA uh, being injected into your system, going around your body and finding a tumour, and yet at no point does your immune system recognise it as foreign uh, and attack it. So far, they found zero evidence that, it, that it's likely to be attacked or that you're going to get any immune-related um, safety. Obviously, it's very early, it's in in vitro studies, but even then they would have expected to see some kind of um, immune response to it, which they haven't. Um, the, other, the other reason this is particularly interesting is because um, this team obviously used thrombin, but assuming they're able to produce these DNA sandwiches to, to the right size and right proportions, to some extent there's not really a limit of the drug that you can put in it. Um, so this starts to beg questions of, um, in terms of toxicity and, and killing healthy tissue, um, not in 10 years, but in, in 25, 30 years, could this be the future of drug delivery in cancer? Like, they don't know, but a lot of people are very excited about it. Thank you.